welcome. I'm very, very happy to be here. I'm just going to share my presentation now. Okay, great. Can you see it? I'm going to take that as a yes. Okay, great. So thank you, everyone. No, I, I think I, I need to stop sharing. Oh, you need to stop sharing. Okay. Yeah. And please, uh, can you reshare re again? Okay. Yes, that's perfect. It's an honor. Okay. Thank you. Great, great. So thank you everyone for having me here. It's an absolute pleasure to be here. And I hope that um, you enjoy the presentation that I'm gonna have today. I'm actually just gonna talk a little bit of the cybercrime lands landscape in 2024. Um, I'm gonna focus on just a few things today. So the types of cybercrime that uh, we're currently, that are out there in the marketplace, um, some of the trends and predictions for 2024, uh, potential consequences of a cyber incident, uh, some best practices to reduce your risk and what to do if you become a victim. And then I'll leave some time for some questions at the end if there are any. Um, so as mentioned, I am a senior manager for digital forensics and incident response for Grant Thornton Canada. I am responsible for leading the practice in Canada and we are client facing. So I don't, I don't do anything internal. I just deal directly with clients. So I'm gonna speak on the experience that we have at GT when I talk about types of cyber crime. So I'm not gonna go into detail on, on each one of these. I'm sure many of us are familiar on the call with what these are. I'm just gonna go over in, in kind of a high level. Um, so ransomware obviously is, is a very common one. It's where the threat actors would go in and they will, um, they will encrypt your systems and demand a ransom in order for keys to decrypt um, your systems uh, that has been combined with obviously data uh, theft and extortion, which is on the list as well. Um, uh, but we do have we do find that there are groups that will do just ransomware and not data theft and extortion, and groups that do data theft and extortion and not ransomware, which is why they're broken out in this instance. Um, we have the email compromise, which again, many people are obviously familiar. It's the one where you have the uh, either it's the person in the middle type attack where they are presenting a browser that looks very legitimate, designed to harvest credentials um, and, you know, MFA tokens and codes, and that the threat actor will log in and gain access to your account or their uh, and or could be a combination of the two. Uh, they are uh, sending you an invoice uh, requesting payment. It looks very official, but it typically it's saying, you know, you need to pay this, but our banking information has changed. And uh, the victim will obviously, hopefully, hopefully not, but the, the threat actor is hoping that they will pay for said invoice. Um, again, email compromise can be used in a combination of, of different types of attacks, but here, just for the sake of clarity, I've broken it out. You can, of course, have an email compromise combined with a ransomware, combined with data extortion. It also does involve social engineering, but I I've, I've, have other things under that category. Uh, data theft and extortion, self-explanatory. You have either they're breaking in and they are um, uh, extorting, stealing and extorting data as part of a ransomware. That's obviously a common trend that's been going on with threat actors where um, a lot, when ransomware was fairly new, a lot of clients, victims, uh, were recovering their systems from their backups and they were not paying for the decryption. So um, Maze was the first one that did it. They stole their the victim's data and it was another method, method of ensuring that the ransom was paid for, for the threat of obviously leaking the data online. And other groups have followed suit and some have been very aggressive on it, um, and, such as Alpha V, who reported their own victim to the SEC, um, that they can be quite aggressive uh, when it comes to uh, trying to get payment from their victims. We do, on the flip side, also have it where there are groups that do not um, actually um, use ransomware. They will just break in, they'll steal the data, and then we'll just... Um, demand payment for for not for extortion of the data. Um, another one that we're commonly seeing right now, and I'm going to talk about why that is, is a lot of the theft of intellectual property. Um, and, and it's really not for the purpose of uh, 
you know, demanding a ransom or some kind of payment for extortion. It's really about uh, for reproduction of the the intellectual property for uh, like a, a cheaper fee or a cheaper price or stealing of clients or and that kind of, of market. It's less for um, kind of a, a ransomware or typical threat actor methodology and more of kind of like the criminal organization, insider threat, nation state variety. So we're starting to see actually kind of an increase in that right now, which is why I've separated it out. Uh, social engineering attacks, obviously there's lots of them, but the more common ones that we're seeing right now is obviously the text messages that you know look like they're uh, Canada Post, that they're Amazon, that they are job uh, um, recruiters. Um, a lot of that's going on right now, as well as obviously uh, cryptocurrency uh, scams. Um, a lot of the deep fakes when it comes to video uh, pictures, there's quite a few of them running now on YouTube. There's an ad that looks like it's uh, Krista Freeland, where, uh, which is the, the deputy prime minister of Canada. And it says that she has some kind of plan for Canadians that can qualify for additional services and payments. It is fake. Um, previously, it was Elon Musk and some other uh, celebrities that were doing it. So we're seeing a lot more of those types of attacks as well. Um, and then, of course, the other ones that tie into the more uh, criminal organization and, and um, nation state level of uh, gaining physical access to, to facilities, particularly around utilities, um, because obviously if you're dealing with um, utilities such as power, I'm using that as the as the most common example, a lot of the OT systems tend to be uh, physically separated from the IT systems and, and a lot of them, the only way you can gain access to them is, is physically being on site. So you're seeing a lot of the compromising of uh, third party vendors or employees to gain access to those sites. And then of course, as I mentioned, investment scams, that being very typically being uh, NFTs, cryptocurrency scams, um, any kind of really Ponzi scam uh, just taken to the the internet, really. It's like a lot of the old fashioned um, payment fraud scams. So who do we see doing this? A wide variety of people are doing this. Um, there's a few new actors into the game uh, recently as of 2024, say 2023, 2024. Uh, typically you would have your, your ransomware as a service customers. So, the way that the threat actor groups run this is like a business um, and some of them, many of them do offer um, payments, a service to to individuals that wish to um, perform their own individual, you know, ransomware attacks. Um, it's very similar to the same way that you would, you know, pay for a license from Kaspersky or Norton. Um, where they, you know, you get use of their tools and their software, you get uh, support services, you get uh, access to a lot of, of their services, and the threat actors themselves get a cut of uh, what you make carrying out the attack. Uh, those types of actors tend to be, they can be an individual or a smaller group. They're not as structured as the actual groups themselves. The actual threat actor groups are very much structured like a typical business would be. Um, they're a lot less predictable or unpredictable, I'm sorry to say. Uh, they're a lot less unpredictable than dealing with the threat actor groups. Um, and you can get a range of skill sets. They can be quite novice to advanced. You really never know what you're going to get uh, when you're dealing with kind of the, the ransomware as a service customers. Threat actor groups themselves are the ones that that make and design and provide these services. They also carry out, out their own attacks. They tend to be a lot more aggressive than the ransomware as a service customers. They tend to be quote unquote more professional <laughs> when you're dealing with them. Uh, the, ta the attacks tend to be uh, very, um, I wanna say straightforward and a lot less messy. Uh, they tend to follow a very similar methodology each time the tools may change, but the me overall methodology is always pretty much the same. Um, so it, it tends to be a little bit easier um, when you're doing the investigation and the review and the negotiation process only because they're well aware of how a lot of this works. So there isn't a lot of back and forth and they want to they want to be paid and they want to go through this process very quickly. But in that aspect, too, they can be much more aggressive 
than um, the ransomware as a service. Nation state actors, self-explanatory. Those are the the cyber you know hackers that are funded by nation states. Everyone has them. Canada has them. U.S. has them. Everyone, every every country has them. They uh, they tend to be more involved with the cyber espionage level and the IP theft level, less so than the uh, you know extortion and payment level. It can happen. I have had it happen. I had it happen earlier this year with the Iranian group, um, but it, it's it's very rare that I've been involved with that. The the it it tends to be a much more larger um, scheme beyond just payment for services, quote unquote, rendered. Uh, individuals self-explanatory could just be individual people. They could be uh, the ransomware as a service customers or just other individuals carrying out uh, different types of social engineering attacks, you know, investment scams and whatnot, and not really part of any type of group. We have the terrorist organizations and obviously self-explanatory. They can be made up of any of these individuals and all of these groups can intertwine all together. But it's just, I wanted to give a high level of kind of what we're seeing overall. The terrorist organizations can be as far as the kind of uh, hacktivists or vigilante groups. They can be part of threat actor groups or carry out kind of the, the same methodologies of threat actors. They can be involved in, in all levels of these. Um, it's And they're a lot more unpredictable, I want to say, because of, of what their end goals tend to be. Criminal organizations, when obviously all of these are criminal organizations, but when I use that terminology here, I'm thinking more like your typical mafia. Um, we're also getting a lot of like, uh, street gang kind of um, individuals that are getting into this game game a little bit more what you would see typically on the street for drug dealers and guns and that kind of thing. They're also breaking into this a little bit more. So what is going on in 2024? Well, there's a little bit of what the trends and predictions are and what we've actually been seeing in here. Um, so we have seen an increased use of AI. In AI has been part of the game for a while now. Um, it's not it's not really new in the world of cybercrime, but it is increasing, uh, especially as the more sophisticated that the AI is becoming, we're seeing more of it being used and it's getting better. So we have had incidences of it mimicking voices, uh, the threat actors using it to phone and, and instead of using the email as part of the payment theft, it's phone calls and that kind of thing, videos, pictures. Um, there's a lot of a lot a higher increased use of AI, and that's going to continue going forward. A lot of threat actors are using it now to uh, write a lot of the emails to sound more believable. It'll learn the speech patterns of different individuals and can mimic them very very well. Uh, so that goes hand in hand with uh, obviously many of the different types of cybercrime that we see. Uh, as I mentioned, the increase of IP theft, insider threat, and cyber espionage, that's increasing right now. We've actually seen, as I mentioned, lower on this list, a decrease in the use of ransomware as a service, BECs, and, and, and the traditional ransomware style attacks. And I'm speaking specifically with regard to Canada and the U.S. right now. It's a little different, obviously, outside of that, but speaking in the North American landscape, uh, since you know the end of 2023, there's been a, a significant decrease in those style of attacks and an increase in more of, as I mentioned, the IP theft, insider threat, cyber espionage, um, more complex uh, style of attacks uh, has what is what we're seeing right now. Uh, increased focus on, as I mentioned, like industries, research and development, pharmaceuticals, technology, oil and gas, that goes hand in hand with that IP theft, insider threat. There's a lot more targeting. If there is an ransomware incident, it tends to be tied to the IP theft. It tends to be a very large uh, organization like pharmaceuticals that have a really well-developed research and development with the goal, of course, being to steal that so that it can be reproduced uh, cheaper and, and without having to go through that that research and development and to kind of undermine these um, uh, North American uh, companies, so to speak. Um, and then of course, hitting a lot of uh, infrastructure. That tends to be, we've seen a lot of uh, increase in that. And as I mentioned, decrease in the other types of cyber crime, the typical ones that you would see, um, but we're seeing the increase in, in the other ones. And we're seeing a lot younger cyber criminals. So, 
um, the RCMP and the Center for Cybersecurity and NC3, they did a study and they found that um, it's starting as young as the age of eight is typically when people start getting into cybercrime and it starts with online gaming. So um, for instance, a lot of like Roblox, uh, a lot of like Fortnite, um, Call of Duty, there's a lot of the items that you can sell within the games. Um, stealing the accounts themselves, hacking accounts, and that kind of thing. It starts at that level, and then it kind of expands from there. So there's actually been a lot of focus on uh, deterring children um, from going down this road because it seems to start quite young. So that's kind of where what we're seeing right now, and we kind of uh, expect this trend to continue in North America. So all attacks bring consequences. There's a lot of things that can happen, obviously, if you're a victim of an attack. There's uh, the biggest consequences, of course, is, is obviously the, the downtime, the financial loss, the, the, the reputational damage. There's a lot of litigation risks. There's fines, uh, loss of confidence uh, in the organization. Um, you know, and, and this does happen quite frequently with a lot of our clients. It's, it tends to be a very terrible situation. Um, to be in, like, typically, hopefully, it'll be their first time that they're experiencing something like this, and it's detrimental. We don't want our clients, obviously, to experience this more than once. Um, but it's it's a very um, it's a it's a very terrible time that uh, that they're that they're experiencing when uh, you know when they call in and get us involved. Like my team only ever gets involved when something goes wrong, so it tends to be a very you know common conversation amongst us to say we're happy to meet you, but we're not happy about the circumstances that we have to meet you in. Um, what's really important when an incident happens is to understand kind of what I've got written under the response side here. What happened? You know, how serious is this situation? Um, you know, what is the incident recovery and response time frame? What has been done so far? What needs to start and stop? And what ways can this situation escalate? So those are kinds of the initial questions once you get over the um, uh, the first shock of, of, of an incident is kind of falling back to, you know, who, where, what, why, and when, and what we need to do next to get this um, under control. So I have combined kind of a list here uh, based on our experience of ways or best practices that you can uh, implement pretty easily in your personal life as well as professionally that can help reduce the risk of an incident. So obviously um, we say when, not if, you know, it, it's, it's, it's only a matter of time that um, everyone will, will be a victim of uh, some kind of cyber crime, whether personally or professionally. Um, and it's all about what you do to lower your risk. Most cyber criminals go after low hanging fruit. Um, they are operating as a business, so they want to, to have as much profit as possible. So the less time they spend on something, the more profit they get. Um, obviously, if you're dealing with, um, you know, a, a threat actor, sorry, if you're dealing with a nation state or, or something of that level, um, if they want to get in, they'll get in. They have the funding and the time uh, to put behind getting into an organization. So that's a little different boat, but most of the of the criminals that are out there are, are after low-hanging fruit. So what can you do to kind of help that? Well, I'm not sure how much of this applies outside of North America, but what we've found in Canada specifically, um, there's still a lot of on-premise exchange servers. I'm, I'm not sure if many of you remember, but back uh, at the end of, uh, or the beginning of the pandemic, there was the Hafnium compromise that went out with the exchange zero day uh, issue. And that caused obviously the Chinese Hafnium group to exploit it. And they were gaining access to a lot of uh, systems that way. And since then we've seen a lot of threat actors uh, exploit on-premise exchange servers, uh, even up until you know this year, it's still it's still a common issue. So one of the first things that I say is, if you have an on-premise exchange server, whether it's you know it's a some kind of hybrid situation or not, uh, you need to uh, get migrate as soon as possible and take it offline, or you need to rebuild it from scratch, patch it, and then put it back online. Um, because there, what we found happened is a lot of people 
downloaded the patches, but they didn't rebuild the system. So their, their system was already compromised um, when they patched it. So obviously it wasn't effective. So that's one of the first ones. If you have any on-chain on-premise exchange servers, you've got to deal with that pretty much right away. Another common one, I'm sure many of you know, password policies and policies and hygiene passwords. And <laughs> it's a common um obviously concern for many um what i recommend to my clients is uh it doesn't have to be complicated it just has to be long so at least 16 characters i say if it makes it easier just do a sentence like i like hamburgers and hot dog or i like pizza and milkshakes um it doesn't have to be all different letters numbers and symbols it's the length that uh, makes it harder for it to be brute force cracked it's not the complexity so um and i also say Yes, don't share passwords, don't write them down, don't have a document on your desktop saying, you know, my passwords or, you know, uh, all Active Directory passwords or anything like that, don't do that. If you need to have, obviously, a document to keep track of these things, use, um, you know, put a password on the document, but also uh, restrict access to the document through Active Directory and group, group policies. Uh, so it's twofold, make sure it's encrypted. Um, just don't be very cavalier with those kinds of documents. Um, use a password manager is another one uh, to make sure that you are remembering one password as opposed to many passwords. Um, don't use your work email to sign in for things that are not work related like babynames.com or any of those. Have some kind of junk uh, email account that you've made to sign up to those things. And don't use the same password as your email account because a lot of the times if these websites are breached um, and you've used your work email and your work password, um, that information's out there already and they can use it to access your accounts. Um, so make sure that that you're you're just thinking a little bit of ahead, thinking uh, how, how a threat actor could use this to their advantage. So don't do that. Don't use... Um, uh, group administrator accounts, make sure everyone has their own, everyone has their own password. Those obviously, <clears throat> excuse me, are also uh, weaker links when it comes to getting access to a system. Obviously, public facing ports, you're using VPNs for remote access and such of that nature. Another few tips too is Google Chrome does have a vulnerability that is known that can you can export all the passwords that are saved in the browser to a, an Excel document. So I do recommend that you go in and check your browser settings um, and maybe use Edge instead of Chrome if you can. Uh, Copilot as well has a vulnerability right now that if you type in, you know, show all passwords, show all search tree, you can actually Google it and find out exactly how to do it. Um, it's really just being careful and aware that as the new technologies come out, there are going to be um, bugs uh, that, you know, and, and not just jumping in and trusting it 100%. Um, Multi-factor authentication is still a common one that we see right now um, not being done. So making sure that you have at least multi-factor authentication in there. If you can use, um, you know, an app, uh, authentication application, um, if you can use uh, multiple different uh, methods to verify access, Make sure that you have it turned on so that it verifies every time um, because there are practices to steal tokens from browsers and reuse sessions and things of that nature. So just making sure that, yes, it's annoying to have to, to type in the code every time, but it lowers your risk of, uh, of um, having an incident. Uh, common ones, again, endpoint detection and antivirus. Uh, protection. So, I mean, not necessarily have to have some kind of advanced endpoint detection tool, but at least have an antivirus installed. I mean, Windows Defender is actually pretty good right now. There's a lot of them on the market that have gotten better, and they have a lot of very sophisticated uh, ways to keep you safe. You can put it across your mobile devices as well. So just making sure that you have something in place, because it is very common that, that we find that there isn't uh, anything in place. You know, and then also the next one, keeping everything up to date. So your phone, your tablet, your computers, just make sure that if it says, hey, you have an update, that you update it, because obviously frequently there's going to be bugs and, and things that are found that will be fixed. Uh, so again, just making sure it's up to date, making sure that, that you're aware, for instance, that, you know, in next year, Microsoft is going to stop supporting Windows 10 
So you're going to have to look at migrating to Windows 11 or changing to Linux or, or some kind of other operating system. So just keeping aware of things like that, because that's what threat actors are hoping you're not paying attention to. Um, the biggest one, obviously, is cybersecurity training is, as I've been mentioning through all of this, is just being aware of what's going on and what's out there. We don't have to be an expert in it. Just be a little suspicious, right? Just just have that, you know, a little bit of suspicious, take a little bit of a step back and a little bit of time to just kind of really look at, you know, what it is that I'm seeing, what is this that I'm asking, asking questions of yourself, like, why would this person be sending this to me? You know, is this really uh, what it think it is? You know, even just if you get an email, you know, calling a person on the phone, say, hey, did you send this to me? Did you send me this text message? You know, just before you click on it or just you know, if you're not sure, just flagging it and sending it to your IT team, just taking that step back and before actually moving forward. Um, you know, hardening of the devices and software. There's Microsoft does a very good job of putting online um, like tutorials basically on how to how to improve the security of your devices and your M365. A lot of the common things that we're finding is that um, individuals that go to the cloud are assuming that the cloud service provider is also securing um, their data. They're not. Um, that's your responsibility to secure it inside. All they're doing is protecting, you know, the servers that you're using, but your little piece of the server and what's inside it is your responsibility. So um, making sure that you go in and take a look and make sure that the default settings aren't left on. And that goes for all things, even your routers and your firewalls. You know, there's a lot of manuals and whatnot online that kind of walk you through it. YouTube videos, you name it. Just making sure that that uh, again, you're just aware of, you know, what your system is and what it looks like, because again, threat actors are hoping that you're not paying attention. Penetration testing and vulnerability assessments. Obviously, this is more something that you would do for your for your company and less for yourself. I mean, you can do them for yourself as well. Um, but just, you know, just have you can't you can't protect what you don't know. So having some kind of penetration testing and vulnerability assessment done on your systems and your networks uh, once a year, whether you do it yourself, it's always good to do it yourself as well as having an external team try to do it. It helps you identify. It's like, oh, we, you know, we lock the windows and the doors, but, you know, there's a fence over there that has a hole in it. Um, it's, it's also a really good practice to do at least once a year. And if you're purchasing some of these antivirus and protection tools, a lot of them have their own built-in um, penetration and vulnerability assessments that they'll do for you. And that applies for your home systems as well. So even just clicking that and seeing, you know, hey, how's things doing? Um, just keeping, again, just being aware of what's, of what your, where your systems are at. And then, of course, the cybersecurity policies, again, this goes more towards businesses and whatnot, is really just taking the time to think, OK, what do we have in place if there's an incident? Does everybody know who to call, uh, what to do, um, what do you take offline? You know, what if what does our does our team know what to do if they find an email, excuse me, that looks fishy or is asking to change, you know, credentials? Or what if you do have somebody that comes up and, and looks really nice and says, hey, I forgot my security pass. Can you let me into here? Oh, I know so and so and so and so. Does you know? Does does do our teams know what to do if that situation happens? So it doesn't even have to go as far as creating really complex policies, but sitting down, seeing what you have, and then what improvements can be made, and then testing those policies. Okay. So playing off of ways you can reduce risk. What should you do if uh, you do end up becoming a victim. So this, again, can can apply to personal as well as professional. So you're going to want to identify and isolate your systems or accounts immediately, right? So this applies, obviously, personally and professionally. If it is uh, some kind of network, like if it's your laptop, and uh, you turn off your Wi-Fi. If it's, you know, you want to, um, don't turn off the computer, but <laughs> just can turn off your Wi-Fi, unplug it from the network, you've isolated your system, right? You want to do that as soon as possible. You want to be want to, you know, if it is uh, much more complicated as far as unplugging routers, unplugging switches, isolate those systems physically as soon as possible, but don't power them off. Just unplug network cables if you can. Um, even doing it from within, uh, obviously more complicated within the system and, and ports or just physically unplugging the network cables. 
Uh, you're going to want to contact your insurance broker, your breach counsel, or your IR provider. So if it's personal, um, one of the things I also recommend, like a lot of this may not apply. You're not going to have a whole full incident um, investigation personally. Maybe, maybe you will. I mean, it depends on the situation. But if you do have insurance, um, I would check that as well as part of um, your policies. What do you have as coverage for cyber insurance? What does it cover? Who do you call? And that kind of thing. So if you do have it, you want to contact them. Um, they're probably going to take a bit to get back to you, but you do want to reach out to them. If you have a lawyer, um, again, this is more, I think, professionally than personally. Um, internal counsel, obviously, you want to reach out to them. You want to reach out to external counsel, a breach counsel specifically, um, because they're the ones that are going to advise you on the data that's involved, the PII and the legal obligations of that. And you need to have that kind of advice when you're going forward. We also prefer that IR providers are retained through counsel because that makes your investigations fall under privilege, which means that a lot of the reports and working papers under that are not um, as discoverable should there be potential litigation going forward. So that's also a reason why we say to get counsel involved. Um, some kind of your IR provider, some people have uh, retainers of other providers, you obviously want to contact them immediately or get a provider. If this happens personally, one of the things I do recommend is that you do contact law enforcement. Um, you want to do it through the Center of Cybersecurity. They have a form you can fill out. Um, they're getting better at it, but you want to be able to have that law enforcement support uh, because they're the ones, for instance, that can put pressure on the bank if you've had somebody access your bank account. Um, banks like to um, give you a little bit of a hard time if you're calling in trying to get the payments frozen or reversed. You get a little bit more of that pressure if you have law enforcement um, behind your back, right? It's a, it's a little bit easier for a company to put pressure uh, on a bank than it is an individual. So you having that little extra oomph behind you um, will help. So um, after you've contacted everyone that you need to contact, obviously you want to get back up and running as soon as possible, but without destroying the data that's happened if you're going to do an investigation. And obviously you do need to do an investigation. You need to find out how they got in, what they touched and what they took um, and the extent of the damage. So you want to try to get back up and running as safely as possible, whether this is setting up um, additional clean systems and uh, slowly restoring from backups as much as you can while taking your time scanning, making sure the backups are not infected. Because obviously until the investigation is done, you won't know when they got in. So you just want to take your time and get back up and running as safely and securely as possible while making sure that you're not destroying too much of the forensic data um, before that's unnecessary, unnecessary destruction of data. Obviously some data may have to be destroyed in the recovery process, but it is what it is, just not too much of it. Uh, you're going to do, want to obviously investigate the incident, as I mentioned, uh, because that you can't uh, you can't have any answers for your shareholders or for your clients or for any legal um, entities uh, if you don't investigate. And and I think we're at the point in the world now where it's very ex these things have become unfortunately more normal. So the stigma behind reporting. That you've been a victim of an incident is a lot less and it's actually reversed it's it's actually more frowned upon now that if you don't um disclose at least saying we've been a victim of an incident we're working to figure it out um it, it's actually very much looked down upon uh if you don't say that and there are companies in north america that have done that as i mentioned with uh alpha V, who reported to the SEC about their victim, and it's because their victim was staying quiet about the incident. So um, there's a lot of uh, laws in Canada that are being done at the moment where uh, there can be federal fines, provincial fines, and, and so on, so on and so forth for companies that do not disclose that they are victims of an incident uh, on top of just the, the PII. Uh, laws and regulations. So you do want to have some kind of investigation. Um, it is probably preferable to get um, a DFIR expert involved, their team involved, um, because they're trained to do that, whereas your internal IT team is not necessarily trained to do that. 
Um, they're going to perform their own investigation, obviously, but it's not it's not the same. And there's going to be questions that everyone has that need to be answered. Um, and you're also your internal team is going to be busy trying to get you back up and running. So, I mean, in Canada here, it's uh, the the number of of cybersecurity professionals is quite small and a lot of our clients are small medium sized businesses uh, so a lot of the times they don't have the budget to have a full security team they most of the time it is a managed services provider obviously that person's concerned with getting you know the lights on and, and keep everything running it's not their you know security is not their specialty so it's you need to you need to find a professional to to come in and help you not always the case, but it tends to be for our, our situation. Obviously, work with counsel about the PII and, and PHI obligations. There are obviously different ones. I'm not a lawyer, so I can't really advise on, on all of that. Um, I can give advice based on my experience, but you do need to deal with a lawyer when it comes to this. They will help you what you need to say, what you need to do, uh, your ethical obligations, as well as your legal ones, um, and your incident team will help you identify you know who what the contents of the PII that was stolen and who needs to be contacted and 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 what should be done as far as credit monitoring and those kinds of things um and then of course one of the final things you're obviously not final like these are all done simultaneously um you're going to be improving your security posture as you go um so part of the of the investigation also helps double at the fact of how they got in it can show vulnerabilities in your system things that you can do to uh, improve and make sure that they don't get back in again, you don't suffer another incident, um, and then you're going to want to keep going forward and making those improvements. So that was my presentation. I think I've left a little bit of time for questions if we have any. Um, so thank you everyone for listening to me. I hope you found it insightful. I am always happy to connect and chat and have virtual or in-person coffees if you're in Canada um, or virtual ones if you're not. Um, so thank you. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you very much. Uh, very interesting presentation and uh, very interesting thoughts. Thank you very, very much. I I think we have quite a number of questions. Oh, good. Okay. Uh, uh i will try to filter out some uh, repeated one or some the ones that you have mentioned but uh, the, the number of questions is actually interesting that this means that how much the audience were actually interested in the uh, in the presentation and in the topic as well Great. so probably the first thing you it was mentioned during the presentation artificial intelligence this mm -hmm. probably is a high book is a hype that everyone is talking about now um uh, some of uh, one question related to how artificial intelligence in, in, is impacting the way cyber crime is carried out in 2024. Yes, so it is obviously it's impacting everything, not just cyber crime, um, and it's going to continue impacting because it's just going to become more sophisticated. It's going to become more built into our devices, more part of our lives. Um, it was already impacting us, for instance, like uh, Alexa. And Google, uh, you know, they already are a form of AI, and we've already had it for a number of years. Um, and there have been incidences where, you know, uh, we found out, oh, they're they're listening to us twenty four seven. Our devices are listening to us twenty four seven. There is a team of people; they do record what we say and what we do. And there's teams of people that review the content. So that is going to continue. And as a digital forensics person, I do not have any of those devices in my house. I am. I don't use AI um, because, again, I mean, it's good for me. It's like the fact that if you're if somebody's going to do something bad, I've got multiple ways that I can find evidence to do it. But it's just realizing that you know, if you are here's the biggest thing I say to everyone: if you are not paying for something, you are the product. Okay, so they are recording everything that you do, and they're selling it because it's all about marketing, right? Yeah. Just keep that in mind. Thank you. Uh, this is a question from uh, someone from a public sector, I believe, uh, mm -hmm. uh, working in a public sector, uh, in cyber investigation in public sector. And uh, his question is related to challenges uh, 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 facing public sector regarding cybersecurity. 
Yes. So the biggest one that we find, and again, I'm speaking for Canada, so we're a little bit behind the rest of the world. Um, but the biggest one that we find is the lack of funding, the lack of uh, qualified cybersecurity people, uh, and the lack of support, uh, really, from upper management uh, is, is the common thing that, that we find. There's a lot of red tape that has to be done in the public sector to get anything done. And it's, it takes time to push a lot of that through. And then also the fact that um, trying to find qualified people um, and also there's a lack of understanding of what of, from upper management of what actually needs to be done. So there tends to be a lot of um, overcomplication and overspending of things that should be quite simple. That seems to be the common trend, trend in Canada. That's what I want to say. I, I think probably I understand because, because of the, the way the question is formed, I understand that probably this is someone from the law enforcement here in UK. Yes. And uh, probably I should give you a background that law enforcement here uh, is a public sector, of course, mm -hmm. uh, uh, and not most of the cyber um, security specialists will be interested in working in the uh, law enforcement because the salaries and the opportunities. So you the got question it. <laughs> it's so the same question, here <laughs> yes exactly the question that is is actually the uh, uh, he's asking how to face or how to mitigate these challenges especially in regarding um, the rise of cyber crime in 2024 what's your opinion one. about this yes so grant thornton personally has um is part of the, um, I want to say, public-private cybersecurity um, exchange advisory group. Uh, so we are uh, with the RCMP and uh, NC3 and, and uh, the Center for Cybersecurity, or C3, um, who are working quite hard to uh, help bridge the gap between the public and the private sector and also to improve um, and improve a lot of the way cyber crime is is dealt with and handled in Canada and the view behind it. I mean, really, when it comes down to it, crime is crime, right? So we're trying to, to say, you know, it's whether it, it happens on the internet, it's still crime, it's still financial crime, it's still fraud. So we're working together as a group to provide resources and training and tools to uh, other members of law enforcement. So and also the the, the private sector, um, as well as intelligence and, and a lot of that, that collaboration between all of us to improve the landscape, uh, you know, within Canada and globally, because obviously the RCMP works globally, um, you know, they also work with uh, the FBI and Homeland Security. So we're, we are trying to do that. It's, we're better and stronger together than we are apart. And that's basically how this has to go, because obviously, you know, my client's not going to pay me, nor do I have the authority to go out and find and arrest these people. That's not me, right? The bigger picture is law enforcement. They're the ones that are going to to take these people down. And they have been. They've actually been taking a lot of them down, which is another reason why we've seen a decrease in ransomware and BEC is because of what they've done. It takes time, but they do take them down. Mm. So, um that's really how we have to go forward is is understanding and collaborating collaborating and under and realizing that you know these cyber criminals all work together well so do we we need to work together too that uh, the takeaway message is collaborative i think this is the only way for a law enforcement with low budget can do some um, advanced investigation by doing the more collaboration with more um specialized firms and specialized organization exactly yeah uh, this question is coming from one of the uh, uh, one of our followers in the united states and is related to have the global political tension impacting uh, cyber crime in 2024 i think it, you can answer it from your capacity in canada you don't need to actually to talk about the global scope but maybe you can speak uh, you can answer from your capacity as you have seen in the firm in the cyber crime and uh, what impacting canada I, I don't want to get any create any tension uh, because you have uh, viewers yeah. from different places in the world yeah Yes. So Canada and the landscape is different. I mean, we have I have lots of lots of lovely friends in the U.S. and, and it is a different landscape than in Canada. 
is why I say I speak for Canada, <laughs> because that's my experience. <laughs> um, and yes, yeah, so what I've been seeing is like, as I mentioned in the presentation, we've, we have seen less ransomware um, and less BEC. They're still there, but less, right? It's a little bit less of a focus. And a lot of that seems to be what law enforcement has done in the background at the moment. Do I think it's going to stay this way? Absolutely not. They're going to come back, but just currently right now, they seem to be scattered. Uh, so it seems to be less. So the attacks that we have been seeing have been obviously, as I mentioned, very large public and like private and public entities. The focus is different right now. Um, and I think that's only because they're uh, finding their footing again. And what's been coming in my door is much more the, the IP theft insider threat um, than it has been like BECs and ransomware. It's, it's much more complicated. So I, like for us specifically, at GT, we do digital forensic investigations and we do incident response investigations. Uh, so we typically deal with a wide variety of um, crime in general. Uh, and it's and it seems to be the digital forensic side is a little bit busier only because the type of attacks have have changed. It's like they're they're still a cyber crime, but because they're not necessarily fitting ticking the boxes of you know what you typically expect cyber crime to be. It's falling what we call the digital forensic side, and that just tends to be the methodology has just changed a little bit, uh, which is why I go around and saying, so, you know, cybercrime is still fraud. It's still crime. Mm. Yeah. Uh, a question coming from a PhD student in, mm -hmm. in France, and she's doing mm -hmm. something related to uh, cybersecurity management. Mm -hmm. So here, Question is related to how are businesses of different sizes, micro, small, medium, and the large, mm -hmm. uh, put priorities for cybersecurity? I believe that this is a very big question, yeah. uh, uh, but probably you can give her the main uh, insights that you can see, uh, yeah. or maybe you can give her a reference if she can read, because I can understand that this will take too much time to answer. <laughs> so I put a pressure in this, yeah. Yes. So it is a complicated question. Again, I'm speaking specifically for Canada, but I'm sure aspects of this apply all over. Um, I've seen really the same kind of problems across all levels of businesses. So, I mean, we've done, uh, you know, mom and pop shops all the way up to extremely large enterprises to um, nonprofits and, and the like. And the common themes, as I mentioned with law enforcement, tend to be, as I said, uh, just the lack of understanding uh, and the lack of, of budget, right, and financial mm -hmm. budget um, tend to be the, the two biggest pieces of this. Uh, the, you know, the lack, obviously, of, of qualified uh, cybersecurity people in Canada, the lack of budget and the lack of understanding, and that goes across all levels. It's getting better, but it is a small, it's a, it's a slow climb, right? And as I mentioned, Canada is behind the rest of the world. Um, when it comes to everything, not just not just cybersecurity. I love my country; it's great. Um, <laughs> but it it tends to be, you know, there's a it's a little bit more than that um, than what you'd find obviously in the U.S. The U.S. is obviously much more ahead of us than than Canada is, but it's getting better. But overall, that's that's as a high level, that tends to be the three things that I see across across Canada. Um, great, great. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for this. Uh, I believe you give her the most important topic that she can use and she can build uh, based upon it. Mm -hmm. And uh, the single, uh, another question related to uh, uh, the same question, actually, how is the cost of cyber attack on businesses expected to change in 2024? Wow, that's a good one. Um... <laughs> that's a hard question for me to answer only because there are a lot of caveats involved in cost. Um, it really comes down to uh, the cost, uh, individual risk appetite for a business, right? So they, this is something they need to prepare before they have an incident. Um, and, and they really need to go in and evaluate, you know, where they are um, as far as on cybersecurity. Uh, and and where they're comfortable risk wise, uh, because you know an incident can be small. I mean, our average incidents can be anywhere between you know fifteen thousand to fifty thousand dollars, right? Um, or it can go up to a hundred thousand, hundred fifty thousand, two hundred thousand. Like it really depends 
on a lot of factors. So it's hard for me to give an answer to that question. Um, thank you. I believe you she can um, uh, search for you in LinkedIn and try to contact and probably you can uh, give her more insights, more resources. Uh, yeah. This will help her PhD a lot uh, if you hear us. Uh, we have another question from a viewer from um, Germany. Mm -hmm. How can organizations improve their cybersecurity posture to defend against human error related breaches? Yeah, so uh, that really comes down to, as I mentioned, the cybersecurity training. So it's really important not to just do, I mean, you got to think like a user, just having those once a year uh, PowerPoint slides that everyone's eyes glaze over and no one's paying attention to, those don't work, right? You need to really come down to the user's level to the point where they understand why this is important. Because if they don't understand the reason behind it, they're going to find ways around it because, you know, like these things are annoying. Security is annoying. It makes our life harder to do. So it's really about the organization um, being a little bit more proactive and a little more creative of how they engage their employees when it comes to this. Um, that's, you know, there's there's lots of ways to do that. And I think it really just depends on the organization and the culture of the organization. But you can do things as, as interactive as, you know, the tabletop exercises are always fun. Everyone loves tabletop exercises um, where they get to run through what it would really be like. Um, making sure that you're engaging uh, the management of a lot of the key groups. I mean, you may not be able to obviously involve the whole company on a tabletop exercise, but mm. key, key people outside of just the, you know, the IT or the OT, having them involved in it, um, you know, including, you know, HR people or people in culture, you know, just so they get an understanding, work with them and see about some creative ways that you can include it. Having guest speakers come in and talk about it is another good way. You know, maybe having law enforcement come in and have a really cool presentation. People love the stories and the case studies, and it tends to stick with them a little bit more than just the training. So I would just say thinking about outside of the box a little bit about that. Mm -hmm. uh, this is question from Canada. Mm -hmm. uh, how can consumer be informed about the cybersecurity practices of the companies they are doing businesses with? Oh, that's a good one. That's a great question. Yes. So you can can ask specifically <laughs> the company for that. They should be able, if you're doing business with that company, you are entitled to be provided with that documentation. You can get your legal counsel involved if you're working for a company. So this is a great one for third party vendors, right? So third party vendors obviously pose risk. You are absolutely entitled to ask those questions and to get their documents from them. If you are already engaged in a contract with them, I suggest you go back and review said contract because typically in there, it should include something around it. And if it doesn't, you need to get your legal team involved and redo the contract to include that. And also make sure that your contracts include compliance with your company as well. Um, so if you have things that that uh, security measures that are in place that the company does not, um, including that in the contract. But yes, absolutely ask them uh, and get them to provide you the documents. And if they don't provide it, then I would probably look at a different vendor. Mm, mm, mm. That's very interesting, actually, because in, mm -hmm. in UK, you don't have, you just trust them. But uh... No, trust no one. Trust no one. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, uh, this question is coming from uh, a, a viewer from China, mm -hmm. and he's related to how I how are cyber criminals using this information campaign to achieve their goals. That really depends on what the goal is, because there's multiple groups with multiple different goals, but the end goal is always money, right? So mm -hmm. there's there's the goal in everything is always money, whether it is. Um, the IP theft to recreate the products for cheaper um, or to steal clientele, you know, that end goal is money. Ransomware obviously is the ransom is money, um, you know, drugs, weapons, and all of those kinds of things. It's money. The Ponzi schemes is money. It's always money, right? Mm. But there's just different ways they go about it. Mm. Mm. 
Uh, this is another question from Canada as well. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's related to, are there any legal changes anticipated in 2024 that could impact how cyber crime, cyber crime is addressed? I am not personally aware of legal changes to cyber crime at the moment, as far as a federal or provincial law, but internally, the RCMP and NC3 and C3 are doing a lot of measures right now um, to change the way cybersecurity is viewed and handled across both public and private. So if you follow me on LinkedIn, I don't know if you'll if you'll see it a lot, but if you follow me on LinkedIn, I usually post a lot of that stuff. Um, when I get articles of things that law enforcement has been done, because they'll send them to me, I'll post them so that you can see it. Um, I've had conversations with them about exactly what you're mentioning about being more visible to the public and changing the way the public views uh, law enforcement when it comes specifically to cybersecurity. Because right now the assumption is they're not going to do anything. Um, and you know, you call the police if somebody breaks into your car, but if somebody breaks into your Facebook account, you don't typically call them really, and it's kind of sort of the same thing. So it's all about changing that at the moment. So there's a lot of um, uh, boots on the ground, I want to say, as far as visibility of RCMP out there now, um, mm. more. We're saying that, you know, we're here, we will help you. And and they're they're providing more training to, it's, it's not so much like, for instance, I'm in Ontario, so we have OPP, we have Toronto Police Services in York Region. They have very good cybersecurity um, people and practices, but it's more for the smaller units outside of the larger cities that if you have an incident out there and you contact them, they themselves are also overwhelmed and don't really know who to contact and what to do. Uh, so there's part of, of of it is targeting that, and the other part obviously is is letting you know is changing how the view how the public views law enforcement with cyber. Mm. So um, so it is changing, not necessarily laws per se yet. I know it's probably going to come, um, but there is a lot more visibility. You'll see them um, out a lot more. I, I, I just would like to apologize because the questions is too much and I believe it's 12 at your side. So this yeah. is, uh, we, we way outside the time. I will just read one question and actually it's from uh, Montreal. So the, uh, the reader, he say he's working in a big company in Montreal and mm -hmm. they are facing a global shortage of cybersecurity professional. Yeah. Uh, how this can impact his organization ability to defend and what the proposed or potential mitigation against this kind of situation? That's a very big question that's affecting a lot of organizations right now, not just yours. But yes, there is a very large shortage of people in cybersecurity. There's even a bigger shortage of people in my field. I think there's like, I don't know, I've been told that there's like 30 of us. I like to think it's more. Um, but uh, it's it's quite small in Canada, I'm saying specifically. So, and a lot of the, the what's happening as well is many of the firms in Canada are, uh, there's salary concerns as well. So obviously the cost of living in Canada, salary in Canada, um, you're also not only dealing with uh, Canadian companies trying to, to poach from a very small pool, but also American companies um, mm. and globally. Uh, because a lot of American firms uh, can work remotely. You're making U.S. dollars, which, you know, obviously is like double what it is in Canada. So it's a, it's a very large, complex problem. There is no easy solution for it. Uh, unfortunately, it's going it's it's going to take time for a lot of things to change before it's going to improve. And that's kind of um it's for everyone. We're all in the same boat right now. I'm sorry, I don't have a better answer. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you very much. I uh, I highly appreciate your willingness and this uh, interesting presentation and uh, willingness to address um, questions. I still actually there are a lot of questions. I probably uh, I would like to ask viewers to either to communicate with you in, in LinkedIn. Mm -hmm. uh, there are some interesting questions from uh, some law enforcement um, 
in Canada, but probably I will uh, I will leave this outside because I believe we are a little way out of our uh, time. So thank you very much for uh, this presentation, um, and uh, thank you very much for uh, coming us today for the Association of Cyber Forensics and um, uh, Threat Investigation.